Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. Hi, my name is Kevin Wong and I'm the director of the Desert Institute at Joshua Tree National Park, which is the educational program of the Joshua Tree National Park Association. With me is Lara Roselle of the National Park Service, who originally proposed a series of webinars to train park staff on park specific projects while they were working remotely during this pandemic. We will be your hosts and the producers of this of these webinars. Before we get started, I'd like to offer a few tips on how to use this webinar effectively. As internet bandwidth is heavily used in California during this stay at home direction, and so many of us are working remotely, we may have issues with internet connections. If you're using audio through your computer, and if your audio poses problems during this presentation, you may want to turn to the call in option using your telephone. The phone number and access code for the presentation is found on the registration confirmation page that you all received. In addition, when the webinar begins, you'll see a small control panel on your screen, generally in the upper right-hand corner. If you click on the red arrow, the control panel will expand. At the bottom of the control panel, there is a chat feature where you can ask questions that we can present to the speaker at the end of the presentation. There will be a few moments during the presentation when Kane West will pause to answer any questions that you have. We will unmute the audience so that you can ask questions. Please try not to ask all of your questions at the same time. At this time, we will begin. Today's presentation is Joshua Tree, A Place in the American West by Kane West, a National Park Service interpretive ranger who you all probably know. Kane, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, it's very exciting to hear Joshua Tree National Park. I want you all to know that I am comfortably seated approximately 2,800 miles away, lots of gas, and the dogs are outside. Uh, but it is a good time to be back in the desert because I have not seen the light and um, or the, the stars in probably a couple of weeks, which is really sad. Uh, so today's program, as Kevin just mentioned, is going to be the first of this um, sort of an attempt to keep up training and sort of curiosity about the park. And what my goal is, is to present what is typically my history focused evening program about the park, um, but also to demonstrate some of the problems and challenges that I have um, as I try to you know, figure out the best way to go about that history. Now, this particular program is a little bit longer than a normal evening program. It's roughly about 55 minutes to an hour and the reason for that is because I like to talk too much and because uh, UC Riverside asked for somebody to come in and talk about the park, the park history, and specifically talk about Minerva Hoyt and sort of the, the development of, the, of Joshua Tree as a national monument and then a national park. And I said, yes, we will talk about those things, but I'm a history nerd, so we have to put even Minerva Hoyt into a context. So we'll have a, a good bit of her story uh, as we go along. I am going to try to pause um, a few times throughout the program for, uh, for questions and curiosities. All right, and are we going, uh, Kevin, can we uh, get everybody to do a one, two, three, hello, just so I can get inspired, because even the dogs left the room. I am so boring already. On the um, control panel, I believe at the bottom, there is a hand that you can raise. You can raise your hand, and um, we can see how many people have raised their hand. Oh, well, I like that. Okay. So let's begin. Yeah, I just got, oh, all right. So as we go through, if we only have 10 technical difficulties, then that will be too few. The goal is to have as many as possible in our first presentation. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is, or afternoon for y'all, is all the different understandings of the desert and of what Joshua Tree has been in terms of this landscape to a variety of groups changing over time and trying to get a broad encapsulation of this place 
as a place full of human stories. Because while Joshua Tree is this incredible landscape of rocks and trees and birds and uh, you know crazy drivers, it's also a place where normal humans uh, have been for 10,000 years. So how can we see the interaction between a place as intense as the desert and you know, this natural wonder space, right? So humans in the environment. Now, when we talk about American history, um, typically the way we tell that story is going east to west, right? So it should be, and we have a lot of the people who live in 29 Palms, who like to ride around on their motorcycles, looking at you, uh, basically everybody in HR, an admin going west into the desert, right? You know, this is the perfect journey song intro. And even just a random photo from Google has you going in San Bernardino County, going west on Route 66. And so when we tell American history, a place like Joshua Tree in Southern California is usually the last place that we would see. And the reason for that is you know, how we tell our history in the first place. So if we look at this image of American progress, you can see in the upper right-hand corner, New York City. So for those of you from the East Coast, we got you covered. And then it's this you know, progress going west. And you can tell that there's progress for a variety of reasons. One, uh, women who are you know, in their, uh, I don't know, their beach clothes, they're looking for the Pacific Ocean. They are tired of the Atlantic Ocean. And so they're going west. Something that is unusual for people from Joshua Tree when we see an image like this is the amount of cell phone reception. So obviously this is a lie, and so not all historical images are quite accurate, but we can see that there's this notion of progress. And not only that, we believe in Wells Fargo as the number one banking institution for the West. Other images that we have of this story are uh, farmers in, uh, I guess, white, clean white linen doing all their farming because obviously that's what farmers look like, and men who like to have pickaxes on their shoulder and walk thousands of miles as their daily calisthenics. The other part of this story is sort of um, this untamed wilderness, and it's often inhabited, at least in the you know, east-west story, by Native Americans being pushed out, going west with their travois and their dogs. Um, I know we have some dog fans on here, so I had to include this image. Ali Jimenez, here's looking at you. And also part of this concept of the West are you know, these amazing mountain landscapes where you can wake up at five in the morning, freezing to your very bones and have one picture that sort of makes it worth it. Right? So we can see those Western mountains. And then for those of you who don't like mountains, but you like great uh, food options, you're going to San Francisco, home of the three-time recent uh, NBA champions, the Golden State Warriors. They're going to resurge next year. Don't worry. Right? So we not only have this landscape, but we have this uh, urban scape of you get to the West and it's a place of dreams, right? It's an Easter to West uh, progression. And for some of you who like to live in places with um, you know, neighborhood upon neighborhood upon neighborhood upon neighborhood upon suburb upon suburb, you can also live in Los Angeles. So we can conceptualize that east-west story. But the reality is, when we talk about Joshua Tree, it has long been you know, a place filled with humanity, right? It's a place uh, with the Serrano, the Chimawebe, the Mojave, the Kawea. These are some of our affiliated tribes. Uh, from the last, from the re from recorded history, but it goes back even further than that. So we have to take on the task of understanding how uh, the, the modern conception of what is now Joshua Tree has not always been that way. We've created this as a new story on this landscape that is thousands and thousands of years old. And so when we talk about the park, we can see 10,000 years of human history and we can go down into the Pinto Basin. And the question for us as park rangers is how do we make the Pinto Basin fascinating to people who usually just drive through it at 35 miles an hour? I can promise you nobody ever goes more than 35 miles an hour on that road. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And that it's a, you know, this is part of the story of understanding human relationships 
with this region. And so if we look at that uh, pencil point up in the right-hand corner, we can see that people have been understanding the Pinto Basin not only as this dry landscape, but as a place with uh, some fluvial deposits and with intermittent lakes. And so when we talk about human stories, they have we see the archaeology is responding to natural changes in the environment, right? So there are times when there were lakes and we can see where those settlements were along the lakes. What's a, a bizarrely different perspective than we have today of the park. But when we talk about the, comp, the, sort of the archaeological complexes, the Pinto complex, the Lake Mojave complex, they show us uh, we'll have higher concentrations in periods that in the past it seemed to have been more wet, so let's say four to 6,000 years ago, and then much drier periods, about 4,000 to 2,000 years ago, when we see a, a diminishing amount of archeology. span And then we'll see even in the last 2,000 years, our settlements will change and concentrate and disperse and concentrate and disperse in relationship with the landscape. And so this place has always had uh, people finding abundance and then sometimes people finding scarcity and so when we move into the the more modern groups that have been here the serrano the chimawavi um, we can see we can see the desert as a place where a generation after a generation after a generation could grow up could grow old could go to stater brothers could come back home could watch netflix could grow up could grow old and so we have life that is possible here in one of the most harsh environments uh, that we know of in North America. And part of the reason that there's life here is because of the oasis of Mara. There is water in the desert, and where there is water, there is power. Now, typically, I would ask at this point, like, hey, you know, what are your conceptions about the desert? And people say, it's hot. And the little kid is like, I like snakes. And the other little kid is like, I hate snakes. Right. And so we have this sort of association with spiky, snaky, hot, dry things. But if we look at the oasis, we have to change our conception. And so what I try to do is get people to think about modern places that are in the desert that have a lot of life. And I say, you like Palm Springs? I like, you know, it's usually older people. And they're like, yes, I like Palm Springs. And then I say, you like Vegas? And then I have people who say, oh, yeah. Oh, I like Vegas, right? And so we know that uh, oases can be places of plenty of wonder. And so if we can grab that conception that this oasis is one of the main sources of water for a hundred miles going east to the Colorado River, holy cow, this place is, we need to change our conception of the desert. And so when we talk about desert groups, they're not all even the same, right? So the Chimawavi are much more uh, mobile. In the career, they're hanging out in the Coachella Valley. They're getting ready for the music festivals. But then along the Colorado River, we have the Mojave Indians, who are the most, one of the most powerful tribes to inhabit uh, the desert southwest. 10,000 people in these hugely agriculturally developed locations. And so uh, when I go to Parker, Arizona today, I am not thinking, get me to a uh, the next casino. I am thinking, oh my gosh, the Mojave Indians have been controlling trade in the Colorado River Valley for hundreds of years and also playing uh, whatever awesome game this seems to be. Right? So we can know that for the Mojave Indians, they're not an east to west story. They are the center of their world. They control the southern, uh, southern portions of the Colorado River. How cool is that? We also have the Chimawavi, who are going to be have the widest territory in uh, the desert southwest, stretching from basically Vegas down to you know, parts of 29 Palms eventually. And so these are people who are not waiting for some New Yorker to show up to tell them that they are important. We have the Kawia, who uh, still to this day are a fundamental presence to uh, the Coachella Valley and the way that water is even used and even politics. Or even. Uh, oh, oh, by the way, Sarah just walked in and she wants to say hi to everybody. Um, as yeah. hello everyone. And they can't hear you because they're all muted, but oh, they all yeah. appreciate it. All right. So when we think about these groups, we can actually understand more of that Native American 
interaction with the landscape. If you look at the image in front of us, this should look familiar to us. You're like, yes, I have climbed on that rock. Yes, I got a star from some kid who was stuck on that rock. This is actually down in the Coachella Valley, and it's from the 1850s. And what we can see here, the reason this picture was interesting for the geologist who was taking it is he saw that old level of the lake. And he asked the Kauia down there about it. The Kauia said, at times when the lake was high, you know, we would move in accordance with the shifts in water uh, in Lake, lake Kauia and then what is today the Salton Sea. And so we can know even from that single historical moment in the 1850s that the Kauia have been adapting to the abundance and the scarcity of water in this valley for hundreds of years, which is super awesome uh, for history nerds like myself. And so when we situate the park in the landscape, we start to wonder, oh my gosh, how are people even traveling in this place that we are today? And if we look at all of these lines that go from Los Angeles all the way over to the um, Colorado River, they look like places that we know. That's I-15, that's I-10, that's 62. But no, they aren't. These are the known historical trading routes of um, Native Americans in the historic period in the last 400 years. And the words sort of right in this area, which means that we're at the center of this vast trade network. So when either you or your family or visitors come into the park and they go to 29 Palms and they go into the uh, visitor center and they buy something and it says Joshua Tree and then they travel back to Washington State or to Minnesota or to the best state in the world, Arkansas, they are being historically accurate. They are using what is now the park, not as something far on the edge of everything, but as this uh, through place, as this connecting center for thousands of people stretching over hundreds of miles. So woohoo, uh, 29 Palms and Joshua Tree. Again, when we continue to recenter that language, it's not that the history goes from east to west. Where we are now would become, for the last 300 years, the center or part of Spanish North America, the greatest empire in this uh, continent for the European empire for 300 years, right? We're not, this is not the, the west. This is the center of uh, Spanish oversight of this region. I love this image, mainly Arkansas, but also because it shows us that it says landscapes, you know, not uh, having been traveled through. And so then the question becomes, you know, how do we tell this story of uh, Native American presence and European presence? And let me see if I have any questions so far. I don't believe I do. What does that mean to understand the European presence in a place like this? We can start from the east and we're going to go west, right? So we have all along the eastern seaboard, uh, Euro-Americans are saying, I want to get to the west coast. And this image is extremely important in that story. This map was put on the desk of Thomas Jefferson as he's trying to get Lewis and Clark ready and prepped for uh, their exploration of the American west. And so he basically said, hey, go to the green line, go up. Take a left, uh, first star on the right, you'll be there by morning. Right? Super easy to get from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean. And so we actually have this new challenge of filling in that map. Right? So how do you take all of this space and say, this is going to be an American place? And we have these great stories that people like to get in RVs and follow along. This map is the Lewis and Clark expedition map. And if you were to zoom in, which I don't know how to do on this call, you could see at each stream the local name from the local tribe of that stream all along the Missouri River, all the way into Yellowstone, and then along the Columbia to the Pacific. How amazing is that to have a geospatial understanding of Native American name and use of different streams? Oh. So, the, so we start to fill in that map and we get these great quotes from there, right? So great joy in camp. We are in view of the ocean, this great Pacific Ocean, which we have been so long anxious to see. 
this is the quote that Ken Burns is going to just be super excited about in his documentaries about the Lewis and Clark expedition. This is about the West as exploration, right? This is how Americans can conquer a continent. What we try to ignore is that the Canadians had done the same trek 15 years before, but we don't talk about them because America, Uva. But we, uh, but we still, you know, we have to talk about Lewis and Clark because they wore cool leather clothes, and that's fine. But those maps, they did, they had stories that were very important specifically for Joshua Tree. And we can start to figure out how those attempts to fill in the map impacted the way that people today think of the desert. Now, this map is extremely important primarily because it is a map of Arkansas greatest state that nobody cares about right there but in there is a very important concept the great american desert and i want you all to raise your hand right now if you've heard of the great american desert okay perfect i have zero hands up so i get to keep on talking the great american desert is created by a guy from new hampshire named stephen long right so most of these ideas of the desert come from people from the east coast because they're very snobby and they want to be able to tell other people how to feel about themselves and he talks about the Great American Desert, and he's going to just describe it in a way that might sound familiar to us, right? It is a sandy waste, an inhospitable steppe. This is very anti-Russian propaganda from the 1820s up to today. And it is an unfit residence for any but the nomad population, right? This is not for Americans. Americans are not supposed to live in the desert. That's for these, uh, you know, these Native Americans, because that's where they're going to live with the bison and the jackal. And this idea of the desert as a non-American place, as a waste, as inhospitable, it becomes really important because of, and we see that already in the place that he's going to mention it, right? We're, it's going to become familiar to us to have, um, you know, Osage Indians who get up in the morning and do their yoga with one foot on a horse and one foot on a bison, right? We see this and we're like, yeah, duh, right? This is what Native Americans do in the 19th century. but if the superintendent is currently on the call and I would say, hey, David, where are those great bison herds from San Diego that you grew up with? He would say there aren't any, right? Because there aren't great bison herds in San Diego. But we have created the conception of the, you know, the desert of the place where uh, Native, Native Americans go and do bison things. It has another importance. If I asked you, if you played the greatest game in American uh, computer history, I would hope that you would say yes. Oh. And so the Oregon Trail game, if I said, hey, did you ever stop in Kansas? You would all say only because that's where Ruthie broke her foot and then we kept on going because who would stop in Kansas, right? It's part of the great American desert. And so we can see that that statement from Stephen H. Long in 1820, it persisted until the 1980s with the creation of the most important computer game of my childhood. And Oregon Trail 2 is also good, but I'm not saying that as a federal employee. I'm just saying that as a personal uh, opinion. And so why does that matter for the park? Well, it matters for the park because one of the first times that we see a depiction or a, a, you know, a really famous description of the Joshua tree. It is infused with this idea of the great American desert. This is Colonel John C. Fremont from Savannah, Georgia. I, again, another East Coaster who's coming West because you know the gas is cheaper over here. And then he realizes, no, gas is like $2 more expensive. Go back, go back, go back. And so in his antipathy towards the expensive gas of the American Southwest, he's going to start describing the Joshua tree with his understanding of the American desert. It is suited with the dry and desert region. And their stiff and ungraceful form makes them the most repulsive tree of the vegetable kingdom. This is the meanest thing that has ever been written about a plant in human history, in my opinion. What the heck John C. Fremont 
no more Bear Republic for me. I'm not going up to that uh, place uh, where they sell, you know, Bear Republic, Razor 5, all that stuff. And he is so mean to this tree because of this conception of the American uh, desert, right? That it's inhospitable. And so when we start to think about how Joshua trees are considered in the American West, we, we see that they become a proxy for people's opinions about uh, you know, what it means to be in the Southwest. And I would like to get a couple of questions now uh, really quick, if I can get a chat going. Okay, I refuse to take questions uh, because I don't know how to make that happen. Uh, but we'll open it up later. And so when we start to see different people's descriptions of the the West, I want to figure out what they say about Joshua trees. Right, so we have Jedediah Smith, uh, who loves you know dancing with bears. He, that knife is not to hurt the bear. That's simply a dinner knife. And the bears are like, I want more porridge. Um, that's a terrible joke. I will never use that again. But um, Jedediah Smith is going to be one of the first white recorders of the Joshua tree. Other people are going to be like George Engelman, who is somewhere in this photo, I think, as they were going on these Western explorations, um, trying to fill in the spaces through scientific curiosity and taking photos and all that fun stuff. But they come up with these names for the Joshua tree. The agave americana. Solomon Carvalho calls it this curious tree with the most fantastic forms. Right, so you come into the West and you get that weird stuff that you're hoping for. And this uh, wonderfully bearded man, Jefferson Hunt, um, or at least his expedition, would record that the prickly pear was a solitary vegetable. But what's really important here is he said we mistake them for Indian. So you get this human uh, aspect of the Joshua trees from, again, this very happy, um, just young and vibrant gentleman. So here's what I want us to do. I want everyone to figure out their own favorite name for the Joshua tree. Jacopom. This is very Dante-esque. Oh, I just love it. You know, it's just wonderful. The tree yucca, nothing in the state of California so interesting. Take that, sequoias and redwoods. We don't need your tall trees. The palmyra uh, cactus, you know, very exotic, thick, thickly covering an extensive plain. The dirt pear tree, the blade of a dirt, very aggressive, very American macho. I love it. Thank you, Jedediah Smith, for that one. The goblin tree. Oh my gosh, how cool is that? This is totally like gargoyles. It's curious, it's misshapen. And best of all, the dragon yucca. This is like spin jitsu for any of you who have children or who like Lego characters, giant cactus of the Mojave Desert. So I want you all, because I don't know how to make this happen, I want you to touch or yell out what your favorite early name is. Well, I like the Yucca Ponds are blah, blah, blah. Fantastic. I love the audience interaction. This is great. Um, we, have um, a, we have a winner in the poll. Sorry, we have a two-way tie in the poll. Uh, Oh, oh, the goblin tree has just pulled ahead. Um, sorry, the goblin oh, tree actually yeah. clearly has it with tree yucca and dragon yucca in places two and three. Oh, my gosh. This is an earth-shattering moment. I've never had goblin tree come in first. Tree yucca is always, like, forgotten about. Thank you, audience. I love this uh, new aspect of what it means to be a Joshua tree. We've actually had votes change now to Goblin Tree, so oh, it's overwhelming. Oh, right. Okay. Well, this is just, you know, trying to be popular. So what's obviously missing from these early names is the Joshua Tree. So we have to figure out that history of where the Joshua Tree name came from, because it was obviously just one of a plethora of great early names. All right. So we have this tree. It's supposed to embody the West. And typically when we tell the story of 
the Joshua tree. It's that it's the prophet Joshua leading the Mormon to the West uh, for you know, salvation. So we have to figure out what's going on with that story. It is true. Uh, this is a picture of San Bernardino before I-15, I-10, I-5, 215, 210, uh, 62, uh, 60, and all, every single other highway that seems to go through San Bernardino. But San Bernardino was a, uh, a Mormon settlement in the 1850s. And so part of the story about the name of the Joshua Tree was because they went from Utah. They said, I'm going on 215. I want to get to Vegas. I want to get to uh, Los Angeles. I'm going to stop at San Bernardino. Was that they were led to San Bernardino with the Joshua Trees. And so the question was, is that story true? Another question was if the Mormon battalion members from the 1840s when they were trying to basically the Mormon battalion they were trying to be super pro US because they weren't pro US but they were going to fight against the Mexican army to show the American army that they shouldn't be attacked because we might not like the LDS community but we'll fight for you yada 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 and so that's another reason why we have LDS soldiers in the southwest and so I went looking for those early records and references to Joshua can I find the first one because if you look it, like the official uh, LDS position is that they don't know why it's called the Joshua Tree. They don't know where those records are. And so somebody let Cain have a little bit of admin time and Cain went for it and he found it. The first reference to Joshua was in 1847 from in the Mormon battalion near the Gila River in southwestern Arizona. There was no timber except a species of cactus called the Joshua's, 40, 50, 60 feet tall. And what I cut out of this is that they even had arrowheads that were shot at them because they were used as target practice. What's the problem? There ain't no dang Joshua trees in southwestern Arizona near the Gila River. They're talking about saguaro cactus. So the first ever reference by this military group who would have you know, journals called Conquest of the Desert was of the cactus, this Mormon cactus, this Joshua cactus. And here's the other reference. In 1874, 20 years later, we see the reference to Joshua with the Joshua tree for the very first time. Feels like the first time, right? And so uh, this guy writes to his scientific colleague, he says the Mormons individually call these trees Joshua. Right, so the first ever reference to Joshua trees is not by uh, people going to San Bernardino. I didn't find that in any of their stories. Instead, I found them in um, in St. George. So it's the people of St. George who seem to be the source of this name, Joshua. And the response was to somebody who apparently had heard that name before. So you are among Joshua's army. I hope they don't take you for a Philistine and pierce you with their daggers. Holy cannoli. What does this even mean? And so when we start to look at how the Mormons are understanding the term Joshua in the 1870s, it's usually as a, an excuse or a reasoning behind why the Mormons should feel very militaristic against Gentile Americans, right? This is like a, hey, we are protecting the desert. And it also, if we start to think about it in this sort of more militaristic way, it fits with this idea of conquest of the desert, of making the desert bloom like the rose. This is not some peaceful guy who's just holding his hands up. Um, Joshua was the war leader at the Battle of Jericho. This is a military reference. We can understand this LDS community, their position in on the edge of the desert, thinking of the Joshua trees in part as this like vibrant army to protect um, Mormon interests. Wowzers. Yes, I know you're all going, <gasps> I need to read the Bible again, Old Testament. And so when we think about um, the West and the Joshua trees, it is this place of a conquest, at least in my opinion. But then the stories of the West are going to change once more, and the Joshua tree is not going to be as uh, important as other things that are happening, specifically the expansion of Yosemite Sam. Um, in the 1850s, we have gold, or 1840s, gold is found in California. By the 
50s, they find out two wonderful things. One, you can find gold in the desert, which is super great for people who like to get sunburns while they're mining for gold. And two, somebody has figured out how to control um, explosive materials into something called dynamite. And so we can do some hard rock mining. That means you can legally and with the permission of the federal government and all your best friends, go blow stuff up for fun and get paid gold for it. And so what we see is this profusion of gold miners moving into uh, what is now the park. And they like to do things like not ever wash their clothes because of the dirty sock camp. Nobody's ever gotten that reference, but it's a laundry reference. And so by the 1870s, 80s, 90s, um, we start to see reports that 29 Palms has uh, you know, a gold boom. Whether true or not is irrelevant. We have cool guys in cool clothes with shovels in 29 Palms. This is an LA Times article from the 1880s. How awesome is that? And so this park starts to have the demonstration of this movement, this extraction of resource vision of the desert. This is not about living here for generation after generation. It's not about Mormon settlement. This is about taking what you want as quickly as you want because that's what we do. We extract resources from the desert. And so we see in the park 280 different mines developed over a 60 year period that reflect that sense that the desert could, could produce something of worth. And so when we zoom in on the map of the park, it was divided, especially by the 19 teens, into numerous mining districts. And this mining, it's, we are the southern extent of what's happening all throughout the West. You will see gold mining equipment in Montana. You'll see it in Nevada. You'll see it in Denver. You'll see it in Sacramento. And you will see it in Joshua Tree National Park. We are part of that Western mining that makes, that sort of brings the material wealth to the United States uh, that makes us one of the most profitable nations that the world has ever seen. We are, we are what the Lannisters from Game of Thrones wanted to be, sort of. I mean, I'm kind of over-exaggerating the point to make a Game of Thrones reference, but we'll work with it. And something else is happening. John Wayne. The reason we have John Wayne on here is not only does he have an airport named after him, but we have to understand how ranching works. And ranching is in some sense the first um, economic activity of the Spanish in Southern California. They had a lot of rancherias and ranchos. And then we have Texas happening. And so um, by the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and into the 1930s, Joshua Tree is sort of this connective point between ranching in Southern California and even into Arizona and California. And so if you like cattle wrestling, we got cattle wrestling. But it's this attempt to try to find some industry that can profit from the limited grasses. And so people would go to places, uh, if, you see, if you see something that says springs on it or tank, we have dozens of them in the park. From Cottonwood Springs, one of the first uh, ranching areas was at Quail Springs. So when you send people to Quail Springs, I know a lot of you are just saying, hey, go to the picnic area. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these are all future cowboys. I should go yell at them immediately to tell them that they are in this place that has over 140 years of ranching history. Because isn't that amazing for people to think about as they come into the park that they are at a ranching location that's called Quail Springs, and then they mess up the water supply to nobody cares. But I care, so that's secretly what's going on in my head when we are at the visitor center telling people about Quail Springs. And they would come in the spring months before it all thawed in uh, San Gorgonio because they wanted to see if they could become John Wayne. So we have these amazing images from that. Right? We have cowboys, Joshua trees, and hundreds of longhorn cattle. It is fought up to a thousand cattle in the park. Holy smokes, that's amazing, right? And so we can start to see that people are willing to transform this desert space into something usable. And that's really important, uh, not only for the homesteading culture that we see develop in the park. Yes, this is Bill Keyes, and those are, that's one of his kids, and he does have a, a pet donkey, a mule. But it's also going to fundamentally change the water resources in the park. So this is at Stubby Springs, 
a sort of a water resource. But the goal of cowboys is to make the West usable, right? It's to collect water for their cows. And so the park is a small example of that. The West has to have a concentration of water to make the industries viable, whether it's mining, whether it's ranching, or whether it's just people on a golf course in Phoenix, right? And so you, it, it, these are like, this is, imagine this is a small version of the Hoover Dam that we are trying to trap water and make it powerful. If you have ever been to San Francisco and you've driven on I-5 and you see the signs and they say, we need more dams. Dams make food, food makes people happy, happy people like to eat food, blah, 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 blah. blah. We can see that in the West, water is power, and that is happening on a small scale at Joshua Tree. And so we can see, I like to show this map to get us a framework for what I'm talking about. Oops, I'm not going to do that. Oh, uh, this slide. Um, lots of water, lots of lights. Lots of water, sort of, lots of lights. Very little water. We're talking 20 to inches down to two inches. Very few lights. It's not a coincidence that you can go a hundred miles in the West and not see people because water is power. And if you can control water, you can control power. Los Angeles gets 12 inches of rain a year, but they get water from the Sierra Nevadas and from the state of Colorado. The Coachella Valley draws up water from this huge aquifer right underneath them. Phoenix gets, it gets something. I don't know where it gets it from. Vegas also, has this concentration of water. So water is power. And what that means for us is that we think about Joshua trees and how they were used. Is that Joshua trees are just part of the landscape. They're used by Bill Keyes to make a really fun fence. They use a scaffolding. Joshua trees are not to be protected. They're to be used because that's what we're industrial people and we try to use things. So this vision of the desert is how can I make this place work? I got to be honest most people for most of history have not cared about what is now the park. It is too dry. It is too far away. We just want it for trade and to look cool in our black and white photos. Nonetheless, here's how I want us to think about that early history of the park, especially 29 Palms. This is the oldest image I've ever seen of the park it's from 1889. This is standing from uh, the Oasis of Mara Visitor Center. I used to live in Don on Donnell Hill over to the right, Queen Mountain in the background. And you would also have uh, a Chimoyvi family living over here. So the Oasis of Mara, it's a place for miners, it's a place for ranchers, but it's also one of the last places in North America where you see that interaction between Europeans and Native Americans happening almost for the first time. This is a pattern that stretches back to the 1600s, and here it's happening in the late 1800s, which is super fascinating to see it play out in real time. Nonetheless, people aren't really coming to the desert, right? This is still a place that is not very fun unless you have lots of sunscreen, banana boat is usable, make sure it's at least SPF 30. But something's gonna change. It has to do with cars. In the 1920s, People wanted to do two things. One, they wanted to get their cool cars and park beneath Joshua trees. And they, the second thing is they like to bring their dogs. So Allie, if you've ever parked your car next to a Joshua tree and walked your dog, you are being historically accurate. Um, I want to tell you about this image. This is the oldest, this is the largest known Joshua tree in the world. It's supposed to be 80 feet tall. It is amazing. It's over by Lancaster. And what people would do in the 1920s is they would start to tell stories about driving in their Chevrolet or their, um, you know, their V8 out into the desert and going and visiting Joshua Tree forests. Because where are you going to go? You're going to go explore this wild place, right? So people would come into the Joshua Tree forests. And tell me if this looks familiar to you. This is in 1927, Motor, motorists touring the Joshua Forest and the poppies of the Antelope Valley will find signs placed by the Automobile Club of Southern California. Car travel made Joshua trees interesting. And not only that, car clubs promoted 
travel into the Joshua trees because it was good for their bottom line. You would have sale, car sales next to descriptions of trips into the desert. And this was amazing, right? This new curiosity about the desert, not just some people, not just people who are miners and ranchers, but now people who have cars. But somebody saw that that might have an issue there, right? So we have to start talking about how the change in the vision of the desert would prompt the creation of Joshua Tree National Park. And it had to do with Minerva Hoyt. Minerva Hoyt uh, would decide that there was too much destruction happening there. Again, somebody from the East Coast going west, she was born in Mississippi. Uh, her, she was born on a former slave plantation. Her dad was a big wig. Uh, he was in the Civil War, fighting on the side of the Confederacy. And she comes from the wealthy family. She's going to move up to New York City and uh, sort of or sort of Nashville, and then she's going to meet her husband, and her husband is also super wealthy. He's from New York. Irony of ironies, his dad was part of a pro-union, something called the Union League of New York, and so Minerva Hoyt's dad was like a Confederate soldier, and her husband's dad was a former like pro, like super union, super Yankee guy, um, so I'm sure there were fights around the kitchen table about that. But when she came out to the West, she decided, she decided that those people who were coming out into the Joshua Tree forest were not being helpful. That the tourists, she, she identified four groups that were being destructive to the Joshua Trees. They were tourists, they were land speculators who were selling farmers saying, hey, you can go to this place, clear off all the Joshua Trees and start planting. It was collectors from Los Angeles uh, who had come out and just grabbed things from the ground and sell them to this burgeoning urbanization in Los Angeles. And it was, um, I think it was ignorant sort of treasure seekers. And so she, she's going to develop not only an appreciation of the Joshua trees as a place to visit, but she has to see a, her transformation into the Joshua trees as something to protect. That this elusive desert possessed her and she had to preserve it. So what does that mean? That means that we now have a whole new conception of the desert as a place that needs to be preserved. And she's going to build off of uh, this new idea that's, happening, this idea that's happening in the United States of national parks. And so this is an image of Yellowstone. And Yellowstone makes sense as a national park. It has waterfalls. It has geysers. It has bison. We have places like Yosemite Valley. This is an extremely important image because it tells us that national parks have big, huge rock formations and that they can be painted by people who like oil paints and that nobody, that you can go to the desert and go to nature and you can be lost and not see people. So raise your hand if you like to walk in the woods and not see people. Okay, we made that up. That does not exist. Um, we created wilderness, and we, then we made them into national parks. But uh, Minerva Hoyt is going to say, hey, I can take that idea, and I can make it applied to the desert, this place full of, you know, rocks and birds, plants and birds and rocks and things, which is a desert song. All right, this is the, these national parks. I don't know if any of you know where this is. Hence, it's in Marble Canyon. Right, so these are places that become national parks that are obvious. They are visually stunning. And Minerva Hoyt said, what if the desert is part of that conservation process? And guess what? It worked. She said she was coming up with a brand new idea of what a park could be. And she's part of this new generation of female conservationists. Now, what do I mean by female conservationists? I mean that after the first wave of national parks were set aside, some of the most famous parks in the country would have never fit into the concept of the national park as originally prescribed without the help of female conservationists who were coming up with a new vision of the desert. And we'll talk about them in a little bit, but what she's gonna do is she's gonna promote this desert place with botanical exhibitions in New York, in Boston, in London. And these were amazing. And because she was so wealthy from her husband, not from her dad, so her, her money comes from her husband. Um, her dad literally wrote her out of his will because he said that she had plenty of money. She's able to fund these things where she's going to have 
exhibitions that are on greater and greater size. I just want to give you a sense of the organization here. She would have plants picked in California, sent on a railway car to Los, or to San Francisco, and then flown to Boston overnight so that every day visitors would have new fresh flowers to look at. Holy smokes, this is a huge process. She's going to win gold medals all around the world. And I'm thinking, is a botanical garden really like the way that this conservation movement is going to happen? The answer is yes. If you've been to a botanical garden in your life, raise your hand. That vision of conservation is coming from the only way you, basically it's like a zoo for plants. And so she would set up these amazing things and she said, hey, Death Valley is not just Death Valley. It is a place full of life. We should protect it. So we see choya, we see smoke trees, we see um, yuccas, feral cactus, Joshua trees. And some of these features would stay in New York and stay in London uh, as pieces. So this is what I want you to give me now your favorite quote from Minerva. Do you like more this world of strange and inexpressive beauty of mystery of singular aloofness, which men refer to as the desert, or do you like more her quote, it's elusive beauty possessed me and I wish that I might find some way to preserve it? We're getting okay, mostly gotta... votes for number two. And. Um... I don't know if that's the use of the word men in number one or if there's some other explanation, but lots of votes for number two. Cool. All right. So these are the, she's going to try to make the ecosystem matter, right? She wants not just visual amazingness, but the ecosystems matter. And it's not unfamiliar to me that she's going to try to change how national parks work. This is Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde was originally conceptualized by Virginia McClurg from New York because she said nobody is trying to protect these human stories, right? We need to protect them from the ravages of treasure seekers. And she wanted to create an all-female state park at Mesa Verde to protect these structures. And so what she's doing is saying the, park, the national parks need to protect not just nature, but they need to protect human stories. And if you look at your badge, any of you who are wearing your clothes today, it should have on it an arrowhead. And you can almost thank Virginia McClurg for making the human stories the sort of emblematic of the Park Service. Has anybody been to Southern Florida? Yes. So this is uh, going to be set aside by, or protected in large part by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who is going to say that this place that is, just, is not just a swamp. I know it doesn't have big rocks. I know it doesn't have big trees, but it is a river of grass. And we need to protect this ecosystem because ecosystems matter. And so we can see that these female conservationists are changing what needs to be protected by the Park Service. This is Great Sand Dunes, also protected by a women's auxiliary committee in the 1930s. So women, as a part of their political process, before they could vote and right after they can vote, they say, hey, not only am I participating politically because I can vote, but I'm participating because I can set aside this piece of nature for generations to say, I am home. So to protect all this, um, we're going to see this brand new formation of something that's basically not been seen before, the International Desert Conservation League. And it has a terribly long uh, under description. But Virginia or Minerva Hoyt is basically going to say, we're creating this league for two reasons. One, we're going to identify what the desert is. So if we talk about what a desert is today, part of that research goes back to her. The second thing that she would try to do is say, I want to gather together all the research about that desert, right? All this desert research, it matters. We need to have it. We need to promote it. We need to make science about the desert interesting. And the third thing is we're going to find the places that can be set aside for desert protection. And so she chooses to do what we now embody. If we read the science, and if we try to protect these places, we are living in her legacy. And then something happens. That amazing tree that you saw gets 
set on fire. And so you now have urgency, right? So how do you create an environmental movement? You have to create urgency about it. And some person, if you were willing to call him that, went to that largest known Joshua tree in the world and set it on fire so that their friends could follow them in the night. And she said that it cannot happen in vain. We must protect it. And so she immediately sets aside and sets out to try to identify all the known Joshua tree forests and try to figure out which ones should be protected. And she's going to find six areas. One is in Arizona. We don't care about that. Um, one is at the Cool Guardi Mesa. One is near Lancaster. One is near Palmdale. One is at Sema Dome. And then one near the Keys Ranch, that's what they would say. So we have all of these different examples of Joshua Tree Forest. Which one are we going to choose to protect? And Minerva Hoyt not only is going to choose which one to protect, she's going to go talk to the big boys and she's going to say, listen, buckos, we're doing this. And so she goes about a four year process of trying to figure out what place to set aside. And it works. She finds a place that has three things going for it. One, it's near Los Angeles. So if you like having visitors from LA, you can thank Minerva Hoyt. B, it has cool rocks. It's one of those Joshua Tree parks that has cool rocks. And C, it's also connected to the Colorado desert. And the reason that that matters is because the first, you know, the park service didn't think that this is worth saving. And she said, hey, it's not just about visuals, it's about protecting these biological spaces. So this park is so huge because she used the Joshua trees to also connect to the magnificent flora and fauna of the Pinto Basin and the Colorado desert. This is a transformational understanding of what's important to protect the national parks. And so when we see this image of her next to Joshua trees and cactus, the apostle of the cacti, she is literally a one woman crusade starting places in connected to Mexico and into German scientists and to South African scientists and to Southern California scientists. And she used her political connections and the fact that she knew somebody who knew FDR to make this park happen, such that we got set up in, in 1936. And so we now have all these different visions of what you know this place could be. Is it a place for resource extraction? Is it a place for cowboys? Um, is it a place where those groups are interacting with the Chimawavi and the Serrano who are living there? Right? But we also have this other vision of the desert. That it's this place that's you know, icky and dry and we're not going to uh, be friends with Colonel Fremont anymore. And now we have this brand new vision of the desert as a place of respite, as a place of calm, as a place that Minerva Hoyt says, let's make this desert part of our rejuvenation. And I just had this cool photo of Dean Martin because, I mean, it's Dean Martin. The reason that I want to focus, though, on those former uses of the park. Oh, yeah, sorry. The reason I focus on those former uses of the park is when we have people go through what is now the park on Park Boulevard, they are actually following the historic paths of miners and of ranchers. And the reason that that matters is because this park, it shows that the decisions, the extraction, the resources that are produced from 100 years ago, we still have to protect it for them. We still have to manage for them. So in the desert, nothing disappears, right? All of those scars remain. And so we can see in this park, it's trying to protect uh, those historical uses, even as it, it has to acknowledge those historical uses, even as it protects for the biology. So that means that in the park, we have, you know, people who are still going to um, the Barker Dam, and they're hanging out in their clothes, except that this kid, you know, it's always the kid who never looks at the photo. But this is a place where we say, you're going to move through this landscape in the same way that those miners and those ranchers did and that their presence mattered because we still have to take care of their stuff. And people decided, hey, that's cool. I'm going to come and visit this park. I'm going to drive up with my cool car and park next to the rocks. Even if the roads are washed out, I do not care. I will not wait for Alex Snay to fix the roads. I'm going anyway. And they would even do other things. They would listen to people in funny hats, talk to them, except for this guy. This guy really doesn't care what this guy has to say. And even though they came to the park, Let's be honest, people had no idea what was going on. They like to stand in this 
uh, you know, this area and climb on trees. Don't do that. That is not smart. We did other things. We, we wanted the people to come to the park and we had no idea what was happening. We even put a, um, a campground in a wash. How smart were we? We had no idea. We like the desert. We want to come to the desert. We want you to camp down there. Do not camp in a wash. Not a smart idea, especially because this is all toxic sand anyway. And we have other things happen, right? We wanted to protect these charismatic bighorn sheep. And usually most parks, they kind of stop at that protection and conservation question, but not Joshua Tree, right? So we, you know, we wanted to say, hey, this is the historic path of the desert bighorn. This is where they are able to survive today. Let's protect them. But Joshua Tree got real cool real fast. In the 1970s, cool people uh, like Mick Jagger's guitarist, they wanted to come hang out with us. And they like to, uh, you know, take naps next to Joshua Trees. That's what he's doing. He's taking a nap. There's nothing else happening there. And I like to climb on the rocks. By the 1950s and especially into the 1980s, people made us a very, very popular climbing location in Southern California. And these changes are going to matter. The most important thing, obviously, that is going to happen is that you too is going to give us the name for the park. If there had not been the Joshua Tree album, I don't know if we would have been able to legally keep our name as Joshua Tree. But now we have the album, we have, this should become our new uh, sort of banner on our website. And so that cultural connection to the park, it's changed once again, right? We, in the 1950s and 70s, we see that there's this new fascination with the desert as a place of exploration. And we see that story continue, such that, as you all know, we more than double in visitation in the last seven years. Holy smokes. And for the second year in a row, we're going to be um, kept away from our three million visitor mark, I'm sure, because uh, of these issues with counting and stuff. And so what does that mean for the park? Well, that means that when we come to the park today, we are in a place that has changed over time generation after generation. So when we take this picture of a Joshua tree today, it's like taking the first ever lithograph image ever captured of a Joshua tree. When people jump in front of the Joshua tree, I am sure they had a permit. Beanie, do not arrest them. Miles, I, you know, I know that you're more aggressive with the arrest, so that's okay. They you know, they're doing a better job than the people who climbed the trees. Looking at you, Miley. And when we see the desert bighorn today, people are like, I want to see a bighorn, I want to see a bighorn. And I say, you're not going to see it. You know, we're part of that conservation story. And when we go to something like 29 Palms, which is now for, um, you know, seeing the sunset, it has been a cross-cultural connection place for thousands of years. We have thousands of years of archaeology in this place, right? We have 280 mines, 700 different uh, some things built into the ground. We have to manage for these as now wildlife habitats because people wanted to get gold in the desert. And then I say, hey, do you come to parks for Native American history? They always say no. And I say, but why not? Because we have generations upon generations of people who have seen the desert as a seasonal hunting ground, as a place of origin, as a place where their grandparents and their great-grandparents lived and died. And these are human landscapes that have been seen in different ways by different people. And if you've been to Barker Dam, you are literally just repeating the activities of those little kids and their funny outfits from the 1930s and 40s. Again, this kid always ruins the photo. And if you decide you want to go climbing in the park, well, guess what? On those 8,000 individual routes, you are part of a generation that has said, that did something that Minerva Hoyt never imagined. She was, I can guarantee you that Minerva Hoyt did not climb up those rocks in that way. But people started to say this, you know, they transformed the park into something else. And today we have to make management decisions based around these cultural practices. So what does that mean? Look at this place 
that we have protected, this night sky. Minerva Hoyt never was trying to protect this place for the night sky, but it became a need as people became less and less connected with their night sky. But when we look up, when we visit this park, when we decide to work at Joshua Tree, we're deciding to work at a place that has protected night skies like this uh, for generations to enjoy. Silver tear looking at you. And when we walk through the cactus garden with our flip, flippy floppies on and our cool, uh, cool clothes, we are following in her footsteps. She would probably just yell, don't wear flip flops into the cactus garden. So I'd like to end with this uh, image because it's really meta. Uh, it's ourselves looking at ourselves, looking at ourselves. You know, when we come to a park, it can be all sorts of reasons. Maybe we're coming back. Maybe we're coming for the first time. Maybe we're seeking solace. But those stories matter because we still work with our affiliated tribes. We still have to keep people out of mine shaft. We still say, hey, that water is contaminated with heavy metals. We still, you know, Barker Dam is now used by the bighorn sheep. And so all of those places, they matter. And our stories matter. And our vision of what this place can be is protected because we are the next generation to bring those stories. So thank you all very much for working for this park. What you do matters to the American people. And it really sucks right now that we can't uh, have it open. But we're, you know, we're taking this place that has often been the lungs of people. And we're saying, let's keep it safe for generations to come. So thank you all very much for listening. And Moana is on is now ready to take questions. Moana's my dog. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everyone. So if you're not talking, please go ahead and mute yourself on your phone. And I know that Kane wants very, very much to hear your voices. So let's let's go ahead and try to just unmute everyone and let people um ask questions openly and then if it gets too confusing we can make it more complicated. But I'm hoping to just unmute everyone and let folks um, say hello and ask questions. All right, you should be unmuted. Somebody say something. Hi, Kane. It's Dave Larson. Uh, thank you for your presentation. That was awesome. Thanks, Dave. You're awesome. What's up? Not a lot. Good to hear you, buddy. You too. I, I should have rep prepped that there are, there are ways of, that I'm trying to figure out how to tell that story. Like, should we focus on the Keys family? How do we talk about Native American activity? Uh, you know, how do we make reference to science and present use of the park, uh, but this was all to get people to understand the connections between what they find as familiar and what's now this sort of out of the way desert national park. So that's my reference for how I approach this program. Do you have another program that you can offer for a webinar? Sure, I have a specific history of uh, Joshua Trees and Joshua Tree research. Um, and again, it's uh, you know, Joshua Trees is, a, is not only a biological, but a human uh, story, right? So if we talk about Minerva Hoyt, she had to decide that the desert was something worth protecting. And so what does that mean, um, the way that we make decisions now, right? So national parks are constantly evolving in what and how they try to be land management agencies. And a lot of that has to do with science. And a lot of that has to do with what people think is worth protecting in a park. You should buy this one. Kane, um, this is Ian speaking. Can you hear me? I can. Cool. Yeah. And um, obviously, I want to let people know that that other uh, webinar that you're talking about, where currently uh, Kane has gone ahead and videotaped it in a non live version uh, and sent it to us. And we're actually going to be using it on our park Facebook page uh, to put it out and available to the general public as well. So uh, keep an eye out for that during the next few days. We're just doing some uh, editing of the video and merging it together and um, should be able to see that. It's a really awesome. I've gotten a chance to listen to it and it's a really interesting program. 
Um, but I have one quick question and that it's all very, I guess, tangential, but my understanding with the dirty sock name is it does have to do with the use of old socks for straining and like the amalgam essentially for the mining process and the amalgamation is that true have you ran into that anywhere else I'm, i think i've only ran into it in like one book and i'm not sure if that's actually true or not i haven't that probably be uh i bet dave or Mel would know they might have ran into that, but I haven't actually seen the specific reference, but you know, that's not saying anything. I'm gonna put Mel on the spot because her name is on the list. Mel, do you have any yeah. thoughts on dirty socks? She might have muted me and been like, Yeah, I'll keep the my name up there for you know, so Kane doesn't feel bad. Thanks, Mel. <laughs> I've heard something similar, that the dirty sock was used to strain the mercury amalgam and leave the gold left behind in the dirty sock. Um, I'll try to look and see where that came from, because it's, it's in print somewhere. Yeah, my, my, what's important for me is when we talk about the history of the park, um, so much of park interpretation uh, that I've heard at other places or just in general, is, is park lore, right? So rangers here, rangers say it, and so therefore it's true. I only want to present uh, information that is found in the document, right? I want it to, it has to be documented or else I will not say it. And uh, so that's why I've created a digital resources folder for people who want to find either the secondary report made by our staff or some of the primary documents. Uh, you know, and I try to do that in this presentation is get visitors aware that you know where we're getting our information from uh, just as a as a source of validating the authority that we take on so yeah if, if it's in print then i can't wait to see it and on top of that you do have your history binder that you have made and made available um i do know i currently have it in my possession to read over during uh this sort of away time from work but if anybody is interested you know they can reach to go over your history by history binder it's really really great and it's a good source of you know that primary uh, source information in a nice digestible form yeah that and that's just we need it you know we were missing that at all of our visitor centers so i wanted to make one i also have these little six page um sort of quote unquote research documents that are one is about the history of the Joshua Tree name. And so it has block quotes so that people can see what the quotes were, where they came from, changing over time. And the other uh, thing I have is for a Minerva Hoyt biography. And it, and it focuses on her primary document. Um, so that if people want to look at that, I've sent out a version for editing with Mark. And then uh, I will send that out to you know more people once I don't have any Are there any other Kyle questions? Kyle has a question. Oh. Kyle has a question and was having trouble unmuting, but he might be unmuted now. Kyle, do you want to try? I think I got it. How you doing, Kane? How you doing? Good, man. Thanks so much for the presentation. It was awesome. Sweet. Um, yeah. My question was, has Joshua Tree ever had a figure like Edward Abbey, who was kind of an advocate for minimizing development, kind of in this area specifically? Hmm. So, that, that's kind of interesting, right? So we're talking about specific figures who are able to become sort of public advocates for something to do with park preservation. Uh, and I would actually argue that even Edward Abbey is, is somewhat different from other figures that we would look at. So John Muir is trying to start parks. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt is trying to start parks. Um, Minerva Hoyt is trying to start parks and try to build this organization. The the desire to reduce visitation or to reduce use that's sort of a that's a park management question, right? So it comes after generations of seeing how a park shifts over time. So um, because our visitation was pretty low, I've never come across in any of my records. Um, okay, I take that back. 
the way that Minerva Hoyt was talking was that she wanted to have more sort of intelligent visitation. She didn't want to have uh, sort of wanton destruction. So she wanted to have understanding of how the parks worked. That's very different from Edward Abbey, who's sort of like a um, uh, eco nationalist, I guess, blowing up dams. Mm -hmm. But you can find in each one of these people a notion of what does it mean to both create but then preserve. And it very often is in response to some sort of destruction he's going to be much more explicit and aggressive in his response tactics but you know Minerva Hoyt did create an, an entire she wasn't a one-man band like Minerva, Edward Abbey she was she created the protection the lack of destruction but using scientific analysis more so mm -hmm. than writing so we won't we don't see that record as well uh, but the the goal is certainly still there for her. And then we just, I mean, the closest that we have to Edward Abbey for this park is that Instagram where he tells people to not do things in the park. <laughs> cool, thank you. Well, Kane, thank you for being here today. And thank you to our audience. Our next webinars will be on Wednesday, April the 8th, at 10 a.m., which we will have Southern California Raven Monitoring and Management Program with Harry, with Kerry Holcomb of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. At 1 p.m., we have Birds of Joshua Tree National Park, Part 1, with Kurt Leusner, a Desert Institute instructor and professor of natural sciences at College of the Desert. And at 3 p.m., we will have Climate Change, Joshua Trees and Optimism with Chris Clark, of the National Parks Conservation Association. We have added more programs and the updated schedule will be in tomorrow's morning report. If you have any ideas for future discussions beyond what we have scheduled, please let us know in the survey that will follow this webinar. Until then, please stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.